So I met Bob first, I think, in 1967 at the economic history meetings, had some chats with him and Stan. And uh, Bob was the kind of guy that uh, I think Tom referred to it too. That if you um, got to know him uh, in a situation like that, uh, you were his friend, in my case, for 46 years, I think. Uh, he was that kind of person. I always thought he was a very serious scholar. I mean, it was always kind of business. There, there's serious work to be done. But he could also be quite humorous. I thought he was... Uh, often humorous in a sort of Yogi Berra way. He said, <laughs> he said things that were funny that, you know, but he didn't really mean them to sound funny, but to, at least to me they were funny. And I want to share not one, but three stories with you as quickly as I can. The first story has to do with something that Claudia, I think you will think that Bob was more like you than you hinted. Because when Bob was doing research on Time on the Cross, he got in touch with me. This was four years after we became good friends and said, I'm coming to North Carolina to do work in the archives. I'm going to stay a whole week or so. Could I stay with you? You know, save money on the hotel. And so he stayed at our house. And what I remember is that um, Edith and I, Edith's here today, uh, had, uh, had a, like a three- or four-year-old daughter then, and uh, Fogel stayed in the room right next to our daughter, Annie. Uh, and uh, after he left, after a week, she always referred to that room as Uncle Fogel's room. <laughs> That was interesting, uh, and then of course uh, she grew up and uh, got married and had a family, and uh, now she has a uh, son, uh, for my oldest grandson, 14 years old, who happens to go to Stuyvesant High School in New York, and so now I'm, I, I think uh, Bob might be pleased if he were still here. I didn't tell him this before he passed, but that he has a grand nephew at his old school, Stuyvesant. <laughs> but on that trip. Vogel, what was he doing? He was going to uh, uh, the North Carolina archives and reading plantation records and uh, probate records to find out about the inputs that went into producing outputs in southern plantations. And we talked about that a little. And then one, one day Bob said, uh, toward the end of his trip, you know, it's, it's a bit ironic that I'm here looking at these farm records because he says, you know, Dick, I was eight. He's a New Yorker, you know. I was, I was 18 years old before I realized that the normal condition of the surface of the Earth was not to be covered with asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, studying farm records. Second story at, at Oxford, and uh, we were on sabbatical, and Bob was on sabbatical in the mid 1970s, and he was sort of a big celebrity. Uh, so there were debates, as somebody referred to him as being a debater. And one we attended in Oxford, you know, there were 200 people there. And some, uh, one of these British uh, you know, know-it-alls jumps up and asks him a question in the Q&A afterwards. And it was, you know, very sort of a pompous. You, you all remember those questions where you start to go to sleep and you get annoyed <laughs> because the question goes on and on, very convoluted. And the guy was clearly out to embarrass folks. And what I remember... Uh, I don't remember his answer exactly, but I remember the first thing he said after listening to this long question that was a bit hostile because the guy was kind of saying, you know, she's this crazy fool that thinks slavery was okay. You know, and uh, and uh, Bob listened to this for a while, and then he just looked at the public. He said, I bet you think I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> is that the, I wish Dan were here because I was going to tease him and say there was a, a conference some years back to do, up in Rochester to celebrate something like Stan, I was going to say Stan's 100th birthday. <laughs> uh, but Bob gave a, a talk there and I always remember it because this was at a time, and we still talk this way, you know, health care expenses are out of control, the rising uh, costs of health care. Bob comes up and says, I don't understand why people are uh, so upset about rising health care. You know, our health care is really good, and there's all kinds of great things. You get your hip replaced, you get your knee replaced, there's Viagra. And, 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 you know, we really have very good health care. And so he was saying, you know, we should be happy. I mean, people are paying this because they think it's worth it. You know, and, and it, I think he was being a serious scholar, but it struck me as being kind of humorous, too, the way he said that the health care is really good. So I have these fond memories of uh, Bob's sort of Yogi Berra sense of humor. Thing. 
Thanks. So I'm no kid, but I've probably known Bob, in fact, I'm sure, for less than anyone on the list of names that Claudia put up at the beginning besides Hoyt. But I met him when I was 22 years old and an undergraduate of Williams College. And Lee had Bob come out to give a talk. And I was tremendously impressed, not just by the fact that Lee was able to get this really famous guy to come all the way up to Williamstown, Massachusetts, but by the fact that after the talk, Bob was interested not so much in talking to the other faculty who were there, all of whom were eager to bend his ear and talk about their own research, but in talking to the undergraduate students and asking us what we were working on, because a couple of us were writing senior theses in economics. So that made it really easy for me to decide to go to the University of Chicago when it came time to go to graduate school two years later. So the first thing I was struck by was the fact that he was interested in what other people were doing and not just in telling us what he was doing. And that's what I saw continually throughout the time that I knew him at the University of Chicago. He would come every Friday to the quad club for drinks before the group went out to dinner. He seldom went to the dinners, but he was almost always there for drinks at the quad club. And there would inevitably be some discussion of some current issue. And it was never the case that <clears throat> whichever graduate student um, who were all completely anonymous for their first two or three years at the University of Chicago um, would actually advance. No opinion was too outrageous or student too lowly to advance an interesting opinion in Bob's, Bob's mind. And he would engage the student and talk about that issue and debate it in just the way that you've seen him debate things academically. Then later on, when um, the workshop was not nearly as active and Bob had his own workshop over at the graduate school, he'd have famous people come through and give talks and if it was a particularly prominent person, Bob would also schedule a dinner party at his house. And those dinner parties for a young faculty member like me were just fascinating, not just because you got to see all these famous people that Bob would invite through, but because, again, if you were the one who was lucky enough to be sitting on either side of Bob, you got to have him ask you questions throughout the entire evening. He'd ask you what you were working on, how your work was going, what things you wanted to do. He'd ask your opinion about current issues in politics or in the economy. And again, there was no opinion that he wasn't willing to debate and no issue that was too small for him to be engaged in the actual discussion of. And I've been at the University of Chicago when there were plenty of people who won Nobel Prizes in economics during the period that I was there from 85 up through 91. And in that experience of having plenty of non-classroom time with Nobel Prize winners, there was never a one uh, apart from Bob who was ever as interested in engaging people uh, at their own level, on their own terms, and speaking about what they were interested in, rather than telling them what they should be interested in based on what they themselves were doing. So the lesson that I took away from my experience with Bob is um, to always be more interested in what other people are doing than in telling them what you're doing, and especially so with graduate students. And that that kind of non-classroom social time with faculty members is an invaluable time, not just for graduate students, but even for junior faculty. And to sort of um, commemorate the um, benefit that I derive from going to those dinner parties with Bob, um, I personally plan to actually kind of institute a tradition of a similar sort at Northwestern and have those kinds of gatherings for faculty and students. Because, at least at Northwestern, it's something that happens far too infrequently. And as a result, I think a lot of people would um, would benefit from it. And I could only hope to do um, half as much as, as Bob did in the course of those gatherings to instill the same sense of interest and engagement and affirmation in the students that we actually have at Northwestern. Thanks. Thank you. People have alluded to the genealogy of uh, intellectual life. So in that genealogy, Simon Kuznets is my grandfather, and uh, Richard Easterlin is my father. Now, since they were both students of Kuznets, 
Bob Fogel is my uncle. And that makes all of you Fogel students my cousins. <laughs> and it's been wonderful to have such stimulating cousins. And then all the adopted children who come to the uh, DAE, um, which, of which Bob was uh, a founder of the feast, back when we were in these dorm rooms in the hottest week of the summer where the air conditioners yeah. never worked. Uh, but uh, we've graduated to these uh, wonderful uh, 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 surroundings. Okay, so I was already aware of Bob, even as an undergraduate, because we heard about his railroad book. And so I, I'm just starting graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. It's early September 1967, and I've already heard uh, mentioned that by Dick. Um, and there was a session on slavery and it was very heated. I mean, Douglas Dowd was ragging on Elf Conrad, and you know Bob is there, and he's you know. He, I said, "Wow, this is really a cool discipline. I'm glad I I I, I want to do this, and I have not been uh, disappointed." And he's done all this wonderful work for us, you know, transport, slavery, demography, health. Now, I would ask uh, a question of you all. I think Bob gave the longest presidential address in the history of the Economic History Association in Toronto in 1978. Okay, I, I see some nod. Yeah. So there's a there's a record. He read the entire paper on social saving. It was great, but you know I, I'm not sure people were quite expecting that. Um, <laughs> he, he does all this in this. Wonderful stuff. More recently, moved on to you know demography, which was my area. It does genealogies gets all this great mortality data, uh, the health data, the incredible job that was done with those Civil War records. Just what a logistical nightmare to get that done. Well, he got it done. He was relentless. His personality just would not let it go. He decided he's going to do it. And he uh, did it, and then founds the Center for Population Economics, which I think is, you know, a wonderful institution, and I hope it prospers uh, hereafter. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've encountered him on, on many occasions. I'm very grateful uh, to him for his contributions to, to demography in general, to health economics, and so on and so forth. So, finally, and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, one of the most salient memories I have are the the dinners we had, or you know, buffets we had over at his house when I was invited over. When I got to meet Enid, and I just I remember her so vividly. And so the very last time uh, I met with Bob, he was here. Was it last year in the spring? He he came, and I was sitting opposite him at the table. And since, uh, you know, I lost my wife six years ago, I felt I could, you know, mention this. And, and I just mentioned Enid to him. And I said, you know, Enid was such a wonderfully warm person. You always felt comfortable with her. And Bob, with his fabulous humanity, said, you have described her perfectly. years that um, Bob Fogel and Doug North won the Nobel Prize together, and I may certainly be the rare person, if not the unique person, who was a student of Doug's and then got to be with Bob. Um, in January 1981, I was on the job market, and I had an interview with the Business School of Chicago with Mike Musa and Roger Carmendi, and we were having a great conversation, and about 20 minutes into the interview, they said, this is great, we'd love to have you come and give a talk in Chicago, but... Fogel's coming back from Harvard in the fall, and we can't hire an economic historian. And I was like, okay. So they said, but you should go talk to George Sigler, the Center for the Study of the Economy in the State, like Rick's story. And so 45 minutes later, I was in, talking to George Sigler, and a week later, um, I was at the business school, and George offered me a job. And it was kind of a fun, it was a short time for you, so he offered me the job before I left. And there was one condition. <clears throat> And the condition was that I not work with Bob Fogel. <laughs> and I was like, 
Okay. You know, I was one that one had to go back and decide. Um, but the uh, the fact that Fogel was that, that that George was concerned that I would work with Bob, I think, reflected some of Bob's influence and presence in Chicago, and influence on the field. And when I got to Chicago that fall. Um, I went to three seminars. I went to the Be uh, Becker Rosen Applied Micro Seminar I think on Mondays and the IO Seminar on Thursday with George, and on the, uh, the Economic History Seminar on Friday. And those ev that meant every every week I read three papers and I went prepared to talk about them. And they were really enormously important in um, helping me grow up as an economist and as an economic historian. And the thing that I really remember about them was that they were all the same sense that they were all economic seminars. I mean, they were different, but they were the same. And one of the things that I really learned from Bob, because this is when he came back to Chicago, he was arguing about keeping the history field. And he was saying, you know, economic history, everybody should take economic history because we have the best empirical standards of any field. And one of the things I really learned from Bob was that I could be an economic historian and an economist in an economics department. And so that meant I had confidence to get a job <laughs> and get tenure, <laughs> right? And uh, that, that was something you could do. And because I was a student of Doug's, and it was 1981, Doug had just, structure change had just come out. You know, in fact, it came out the week I left for Chicago, and I got this signed copy. And many of you may not know Doug very well, but this was when Doug's basic opening line was, economists don't know well, apple butter. <laughs> <laughs> so as a model for a junior professor, you know, I kind of had this mentor thing of going and telling my colleagues they really didn't know anything, which was not going to be a good way to get a job or get tenure or any of that sort of stuff. Um, and I think, you know, Doug and Bob had enormous respect for one another, but they had very different styles. Um, and I, I know that I would have had, I did have, it took me 20 years before I could actually write think do economic history like Doug did. It was enormously difficult. Because what Doug always did was to say, we need to ask new questions. And what Bob did that was so successful was he asked questions that he would already tell you were important, and you asked them <coughs> differently. And so people were willing and already primed to take seriously what he was saying, because they knew it was an interesting question. Um, and so my last story is when I got to uh, Maryland, I was the organizer uh, you know, with Cynthia and, uh, and Dave Mitch of the Washington Area Economic History Seminar, and, and basically what that meant initially was my job was to go pick the person up at the airport and make sure they got to the seminar and back to the hotel. So Bob and I were talking outside of his hotel for like two or three hours, it was midnight, and he said to me, you know, John, the, the, the measure of success in our, in, our, in our profession is influencing the way other people think. And, you know, I kind of, I was an assistant professor, I said, no, the measure of success is, you know, how many articles I get published. And, he's, and he was saying to me, no, it's taken me 30 years, I'm still learning the implications of that. So every, you know, March and July we're here, and other, this room gets filled up with people. And it's filled up with people who want to learn, right? But it's always filled up with people who don't want to be taught. <laughs> okay? And... Bob understood that in a very intuitive way. He was very warm and generous, and he was also very tenacious, and understood that these conversations would always be debates. Um, and that you had to convince people. You know, and that, that this business of listening to what people were saying was an incredibly important part of convincing them. Because right? if they think you're not listening to them, they're not listening to you. Yeah, I kind of throwing apple butter. You know, that was not the best rhetorical approach to take. <laughs> Had we all followed Doug, there wouldn't be very many economic historians. And Bob actually, as an economic, we couldn't, I couldn't no way do what Bob did at the level or the intensity or the scale, but I could follow that model in a way that was much easier than following Doug. Um, and so that statement about influencing the way people think really influenced me. And I think Bob was a great example. Uh, and the fact that we're here to sort of honor his accomplishments and his life and his memory is a real monument to that influence. Thanks. Thank you.